so um, I, I was asked, Brenton asked me to do this mission oriented, take the mission oriented approach to innovation to the States of Change Festival. And I kind of didn't quite know what, how to approach it, because I know that it's a broad church and um, many of you will be approaching innovation in many different ways. Um, so I'm really keen that we see this as an active learning session. Um, the way that I'm going to manage it, it is two hours. Um, and so if you, if you need breaks, if you need to just um, check out for a bit, that's also fine. But um, I think, let me know in terms of if you're, if you're going to come back, I'm a co-host in the session, but I, I want the session to be really productive for people. Um, I want you to learn, but I also want to learn from you. So um, I shared in the chat a Google Doc, and maybe um, if one of you guys can share it again, if for, for new incoming people. Um, the way that the session is going to run is I will go through the what, the why, and the how of mission oriented innovation um, in three separate segments. Um, after each sort of provocation, if you like, or, or a little bit of content, we'll break into groups of trios. So three people in the group in which you will explore what it means to put this in the center of your work. And fundamentally what we're looking at here is purpose-driven innovation. And also to think through a little bit about how your practice would change if it was mission orientated and the challenges it would present. Um, we're going to use a Google Doc, which I'll show you in a minute, for capturing your conversations. And what I'd love to do is if you wanted to use the chat as a kind of parking lot for questions or thoughts that I can return to later. Um, so I'll try and be able to harvest those through the session and interact with those questions along the way. Because um, I, I, I definitely want to, to hear from you as much as um, you hear from me. So I will start with this kind of who's in the room and introduce this um this is where my technical skills come in again introduce the google doc which you should all be able to see please flag if you can't um it is effectively i've given i've, I've given us a kind of working space um and what I'm suggesting you do now, and the reason why I'm using this, not the chat, um, is so that I can hear from everyone. So I will introduce myself, but pick one of these numbers and just start writing a little bit about who you are and why you care. <laughs> um, so as you can see, I've written a little bit about me and I will just, um, I'll just introduce myself while you start and then I'll pick on you <laughs> and come in, come to different people to, to come and introduce themselves. And that gives me the opportunity to ensure that I cover everyone. I find that I find really challenging sometimes when I'm just looking at all of the screens, all of the, all of the um, boxes in Zoom to remember have I made sure that I've co covered everybody. So um, I'm Rowan Conway. Um, I'm currently head of the Mission Orientated Innovation Network at UCL IAPP, which is the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, where I'm also a PhD candidate. And my role as a, as a PhD candidate is um, I'm an action researcher undertaking a kind of mission lab experiment. Um, I've put in the medium link to my um, PhD proposal from July 2018, if you want to see a little bit more detail about what my PhD looks like. I care about mission orientated innovation because I'm one of those terribly worthy people who spent my life trying to um, bring purpose to everything that I do. Um, I've been working for over 20 years um, as a practitioner, largely in social innovation, innovation gen in more generally, or sustainability. I've worked as a practitioner in the private sector, so I was a sustainability consultant and a journalist working in a publishing startup. I've worked at the RSA as the director of innovation, where we worked a lot with um, social innovation and public sector innovation. Um, prior to that, I worked um, in community engagement with London 2012 for four years, and now I found myself in academia. So social innovation and sustainability have always been my kind of goal. Um, and now I have gravitated towards missions, thinking about how do you put purpose at the front end of innovation as opposed to something that's a, a positive spillover. So um, I am really keen to, um, to kick over to you, find out a bit more about you. Um, I'm loving that I'm starting to see all of you here. This is an institute that was set up by Professor Mariana Masukatu, who is an economist, who's a heterodox economist. So she doesn't work within mainstream economic theory. In fact, she tries to disrupt mainstream economic theory, which is why she has set up the Rethinking Capitalism 
um, elective module at UCL as well, um, as well as the Masters in Public Administration, which is focused on new ways for public um, public servants to conceive themselves as innovators and market shapers, as opposed to what she calls just market fixers. It's an important point to make here that we come at mission orientated innovation through a very economic lens at um, IIPP. And I think it's important to say that given the audience that we have and the very many accounts, the manifold accounts of what innovation is, where it goes through social innovation, place-based innovation, design thinking, practice innovation. So someone talked about all of the innovation that's happening now that you've gone through COVID. I'm hearing that a lot from some of our members of Moyne. I would say that in terms of mission orientated innovation, that's the moving fast, which you need to do, which is adaptive and dynamic capabilities, but it's not the purposeful stuff which we're going to talk about here. So lots of change and transformation has happened, which is in itself innovative, but we're talking about, if you like, directed or systemic innovation in this area. And IOPP's mission really was set up to change how public value is imagined, as opposed to the kind of how you create efficiencies, how you um, fix problems, how you enable um, the public sector to work smoothly into public value is about how you set missions to tackle societal challenges and achieve economic growth that's more innovation led, is sustainable and inclusive. So um, my first sort of provocation area is why? Like, why, why do we care? What's, what's the point and what's the state of innovation that we are in now? Um, this is the, the kind of fundamental point that I came to in my, my 20 year journey um, in, in innovation and creativity. So having worked at the kind of um, creative director end and the um, uh, sustainability consultancy, um, as a sustainability consultancy, always with that, someone called themselves sort of bleeding heart approach. I'm coming in because I want to change the world. Um, and then hitting up against actually the economic reality of what does it mean to actually get something off the ground. Um, something that I've come up against continuously in my career is that the economics say no. And that ultimately, no matter how exciting and wonderful things are at the beginning, the financialization gets you in the end. So the financial model, so the, the number of startups that you catalyze through an incubator, as opposed to the quality of ideas or the, or the number of people, the scale of the people that you will affect, as opposed to the impact in the place that, that, is, that creates well-being. Those things that are material are the things that are measured. So... One of the things that that has done, I think, over time, as we've become far more efficient with our economy, um, is created a place where economic growth is not directed. It is a it's a evolutionary process. And, you know, some might call that a kind of uh, neoliberalism, but we've come to a point in our economic thinking where we are effectively extracting value as rapidly as we can in order in service to economic growth. And the point that Mariana tries to point out um, in, in both her book, The Entrepreneurial State and The Value of Everything, is that this suggests its value is neutral. The idea that economic growth is the main reason why we exist. Um, but it's not values neutral. It actually means that we crowd out ourselves the values that underpin um, the kind of growth we want. You know? So we don't have inclusive growth because ultimately our system is exclusive. Um, so growth has a rate and also a direction. It's not just about moving fast and as Facebook legendarily said, breaking things. Um, it's also about directing growth towards the kind of future you want. This isn't exactly, you know, new idea. The idea of purpose-driven business has been around for a very long time. It's really that the economics have moved far more to scale and growth as opposed to that kind of purpose and hopes and dreams and intentionality is much harder to actually get investment into that kind of thing and the returns on investment which sits in the um, financial system are required at a much shorter rate so what mariana puts in is this as a suggestion of mission orientated innovation is that to confront the idea of directionality head-on means that we need to be finding solutions to global challenges the global challenges we face are significant enough you know i mean we're living in the middle of a pandemic but they're significant enough that we need to grip them as purposeful innovation in order to try and solve these things and this will require that we do try and direct innovation towards these 
um, these challenges, specifically things like climate change. And Tom mentioned, you know, how do you get to net zero quickly? The idea here is that the public sector and businesses and civil society together will actually have a role in market shaping. That means that you're creating new ideas, new innovations that actually redirect the, the uh, pathway of growth. Possibly what Mariana will often also say, away from just this continued consumption-based capital, uh, capitalism into innovation-led capitalism, which is a different kind of way of thinking about it, hence the rethinking capital capitalism. Um, if you haven't read these books, uh, these are her two books and she's now got another one that she just submitted to the publisher yesterday um, called Mission Economics, which is looking specifically, they do take a very economic lens. The first one talks about um, why the state actually is, is the, if you like, the investor of first resort and why that's an important role that the state needs to play, looking at some of the um, you know, the historical, the moonshots, the way that we actually crowded in the private sector in order to solve mission-based problems at, in previous times. Um, the value of everything is actually a sort of new account of public purpose or public value, which is really looking at what do we, what do we recognize as valuable? So it looks at the production, you know, our concepts of productivity, our concepts of what actually do we value and give materiality to and what don't we? These are really important books. They are really quite economically driven. So I've found that they are difficult necessarily have to have a read across the whole innovation spectrum. Um, and sometimes that they can, they, they don't necessarily speak to the work of those people who are working in government innovation right now. Largely because I think government innovation that I've experienced and a lot of, a lot of innovation is very driven by the digital agenda, which in itself is giant and has its own, if you like, drive behind it. I would challenge that digital innovation in itself is not a mission. That's just a way of actually moving things faster, that the directionality is as important for digital innovation as it's not an end in itself, it is a means to an end. That's for us to have a big fight about later. Um, so the Mission Orientated Innovation Network is a network of um, public banks, innovation agencies, um, cities and municipalities, um, digital agencies and R&D organizations. So the kind of thing that binds this group is that they all have money to spend on innovation, effectively. They are policy-making institutions that really want to um, invest in challenge-driven or purpose-driven innovation. So we work with them in, in a variety of different ways, largely, um, they, you know, we, we started with network gatherings as it was very small. Um, we are doing increasing numbers of deep dives with um, organizations where we're trying to understand in the context of their their work what does mission orientated innovation mean so how do you actually define a public bank for example and its mission um, and then how do you actually do it and how do you deliver on that these are lines of inquiry as opposed to um, as opposed to sort of end games we don't have as i say here's the way to do it and just copy and paste here this is as mariana would say extremely hard work if you start on mission orientated innovation you will undoubtedly come across any number of reasons why this is impossible which is why i want us to dwell on that a little bit in some of the conversations this is just a, a, a sort of um an overview of some of the members and this is a, an overview of some of the kinds of missions that we we talk that public agencies have um, and the kind of substantive difference between being a benign public sector and a purpose driven public sector. Um, the idea of having a mission that is not just about driving economic growth, but is actually about catalyzing, for example, with RPE, which is the US Energy Agency, catalyzing the development of transformational high impact energy technologies. Now those technologies are for energy security. So they'll have a series of other missions underneath that, but the, um, they are there to catalyze um, that move, if you like, in some level to net zero, and then also energy security for the US. Um, similarly, the mission for the KFW Group, which is the German public bank, is to support and cha change and encourage forward-looking ideas in Germany, Europe, and throughout the world. They are the biggest investment investor in the um, energy transformation in Germany. and they they are they have put that into their articles of association so that effectively they are bound to do that kind of investment in many instances you will find things like fiduciary duty mean that you cannot do things when you have designed something absolutely wonderful 
and then actually you get into a system where there is no there's no fertile territory for actually enabling this Ooh, hang on i've just clicked something that's not where i wanted to be okay so how do we get to mission orientated innovation and get beyond the kind of hyperbole um the substance of a lot of my work is around changing the narrative of innovation and the language that we use public purpose is pretty easy to sell um you it's almost like you can't argue with you know the common good which i think those of you working in social innovation will have experienced time and time again and then you have got to the end of your project and go but why didn't it work then why didn't you fund it it beyond the pilot um i'm saying that from my own experience and not from yours but that's a an experience that in many instances when we talk about someone talked about a structural a, a plaster over the structural in, in inequalities or the structural challenges the narrative of purpose-led innovation doesn't sit within our structures like the treasury green book or other mechanisms that you might have in different countries that prevent you from actually acting outside of a, a market fixing role as a government so the narrative of innovation and the language we use at IAPP specifically looks at how we include public purpose and also creativity, co-creation. This idea that you're, you are there about innovating and exploring for public purpose. You're not just there about enabling pace and scale. Um, we also talk about instead of fixing market failures and solving negative externalities, so the spillovers that the, you know, the, the private sector, when it fails, we have to pick up the, the you know, we do the bailout or we pick up the check for, um, you know, the redundancies. We need to be co-creating markets for public purpose. This is really a, a very strong pivot. And it's also the kind of thing that is very difficult to talk to um, treasuries or, or economists about because they fundamentally, this runs very deep in the logic of what it is to be an economist. Government should not step out of its box. It will talk about state aid or various other um, uh, statutory instruments, which mean you have a small box, you should stay in it, um, and you should just be picking up where the private sector fails, fails to go. We would counter that negative externalities have now become so big that they are not minor externalities, they are um, mega externalities. Climate change, for example, being, um, you know, science has told us for the last 30 years that man-made climate change is driven by lots of things that we do through business, you know, for public sector entirely to pick up the check of the negative externalities of that is no longer a fair conversation. So we need to talk about how we actively co-create markets for public purpose. We put that logic squarely in the middle of our conversation as opposed to well, we need to prioritise the financial growth and then we'll talk about, which is where the CSR conversation, someone was talking about CSR, is, is, is an interesting one as well. CSR is often also about putting the externalities of a business into a box that can be dealt with by a small team, as opposed to facing them as the reality of the actual business. And finally, the really important point that we focus on is the short-termism short of our current economic systems and the systems around how we get things done. In many instances, you know, mission oriented innovation will not fit into a static cost benefit analysis. It just won't. You'll need too much money and you won't have enough return because those returns will go to a, will be shared by a, by a wider cohort um, and they will have public value. You know, when I say public value, I really mean that kind of common good. So we need to really understand and, uh, and, and rethink the commons as how and, and be able to materialize that in how we analyze our projects so that we can overcome this embedded short term in is or in short term in the I can't say it, short termism um, this requires that we think through what dynamic metrics look like you know as, as a mission evolves how do we start seeing we're on course for that as opposed to needing a pilot to show return on investment within a five-year window or within a three-year window we, so those dynamic metrics are often also about how we do these things. And we also need to design new tools, which is where the public banks come in for patient finance. What does it look like to invest in something over a 30, 40, 50 year period? Um, thinking through what does this mean for my great, great grandchildren, as opposed to what does this thing look like for my kids? So the challenges that I have for you to think about are Mission oriented innovation must not only have a rate, but also a direction. I want you to think about that. What is the direction of travel? What matters that you want to innovate around? 
it re requires more of governments and philanthropy. This is absolutely not easy. Um, you know, effectively, evolutionary innovation and its spillover effects of economic growth have justified this kind of passive, ma passive market fixing role to date. And to be fair, they are clear, it's clear to how you articulate that as the role of government. But that can mean that public entrepreneurs, I did a long series of work on public entrepreneurs, always feel like they're acting at the margins. They're always giving far more discretionary effort in order to try and make changes happen because effectively they can't, um, they can't change the system on their own. But we are at a pivotal moment um, where we need to move towards investment led growth. Um, enough of the kind of the proof, if you like, of the pandemic is also showing us this, the proof that we had cut out so much of our resilience through this passive role and not actually asking more of the wider system to invest in the systems that enable us to move fast to deliver purpose driven innovation is something we need to reflect on. So if we're going to think about innovation that seeds public purpose, the sustainable development goals are largely, you know, the most kind of charismatic um, entities that you can use. They're the things that have read across across the whole planet. People understand what they are. They're quite um, broad, but effectively there's something you can hook up. They have materiality and they're on the political agenda. Um, and while they're broad, you can then break them down into grand challenges or these missions um, that may become clearer and more targeted missions. And this is effectively the road mapping tool that we use it doesn't have to be the sustainable development goals it can be you know climate change it can be something that we want to say there is a you know there is a need for us to address this particular issue the missions then are something that become clearer so you give it as as i say greater materiality and then there's this kind of portfolio approach and i've seen and i'll talk to in the case studies a number of people who are taking portfolio approached projects approaches to innovation projects in order to enable bottom-up experimentation that starts to show the impact um, on the mission. And just to, to bring it into the concept of um, systemic change, missions and systems change have that same logic. So if you if you go back to that kind of road mapping, the road mapping shows that it wants to, it, it has the bandwidth going right from a kind of paradigm level all the way through to a venture level or an activity level. We need to be able to to to, to if you like traverse all of those different uh, um, uh, layers, and it's worth looking at that from a kind of systemic change perspective and this this way of thinking, which is often. Um, uh, referred to around the kind of mac macro, the meso and the micro, not getting lost entirely, if you like, in the ventures game that sits in the micro, um, or indeed in the systems change game, which sits in the paradigm, but actually to be able to understand where, where to take interventions in the system. If you're setting missions, where do you need to do that? You must look at delivery capacity, institutional and organisational challenges, as well as you know this narrative question of if you're trying to do systemic change and there's no narrative to help you you know your ventures will ultimately fail because they won't have you're not you're not making the market which effectively is is both at the macro and the meso level so hopefully that won't have been um too too broad based um but i will probably have broadened your conceit of mission orientated innovation and possibly confused you quite considerably. Um, so I'm going to then set you up for the next session for 15 minutes um, to go into trios um, where you will, sorry, close that, um, where you will basically think about mission orientated innovation given what I've just said, which is very conceptual, but recognizing this is absolutely not an easy panacea, it's tough. You know, if you're thinking about mission orientated innovation, what, what does that actually mean for you? So I, I've set aside some space in the um, uh, Google Doc, which um, it will probably take me too much time to share. So please access the Google Doc. Um, I will um, pass over to Nicole, who will hand it over to you. Before I do that, the, what I'm asking you to do is I'm going to put you in the same trios for these little sessions. We put in 15 minutes. We'll probably cut the final one um to down to five so just like it will just be a kind of goodbye to your people in the last one but in this session i want you to work in a very active trio which is one person speaking for five minutes when you've got nicole 
you're going to give them a five minute warning. One person listening and probing. So I've given you some probes. You might, might want to make your own, um, that person, and one person note taking. So you're not writing your own notes. Someone else is writing your notes for you. And then I want you to just go to the next person when Nicole gives you a five minute signal. So they're going to be quite, it'll be quite dynamic, but effectively it gives you the opportunity to really locate your conversations in why and what does it mean for you and someone is going to write your answer so you don't have to write them for you for yourself and then we'll come back to to that before i go into the case studies which is the next part of the session nicole does that work for you works great okay so i shall see you on the other side um yeah so i'll put you in breakout rooms now just to let you know if you don't already there is an option to call for help so when you're in your breakout rooms and for whatever reason you need help um, just just call and, and we'll jump in. Otherwise, we'll see you in 15 minutes. Sorry, Brenton, actually. You... I, um, uh, your conversations look really rich and, as I expected, really diverse. Um, and so I might pick out a couple of things to, to, to dwell on a little bit. Um, there was someone who asked, who said, you know, how do we, how does this fit or how do, where does this fit with disruptive innovation? And someone else was talking about enabling startups and then it feeling a bit like it goes into PR spin. So there's a sort of theme of like, how and does this engage with the current sort of ecosystem of, uh, if you like, incubating and accelerating innovation or startups in that way? Does anyone want to feed in from their conversation around, around that? Okay. On the basis that silence is just a bad thing generally, um, I'll say something. I'm not sure if it's going to be relevant or not, and it certainly comes from the conversation and a really interesting one, which is, you know, it's kind of top down, bottom up kind of thing. This notion that do you start with this fully formed sense that you have a mission and you have it all sorted and here are the outcomes and kind of sounds a bit like old fashioned public sector policy making, quite mm -hmm. frankly, Doesn't it just um, or more or in the startup um, mode do you have an intent uh, and a direction and a, a sort of manic desire to kind of fix something, but you're not quite sure. And actually what you do is you find your mission by getting out there and getting on with some work. Um, Cause startups tend, startups tend to work that way. They, they work out what they're doing by doing something. The mission oriented work, if you're not careful, can sound like you spend a lot of time polishing up your mission before you get going. I think it was that kind of, mix of uh, dynamics that came out at least in our group i think did that come out with uh, that's I, I, i'm fascinated and want to chat about that but did that come out with anyone else you can put like in those reactions if you want to put a thumbs up if that was something that mattered to you or came up in your group yeah couple so um tom beresford you said some stuff i'll come back to that martin well it, it's a bit of a follow-up to, to martin's comment um one of the things that I'm always uh, racking my brain around is, is kind of what are the different units of change that we're talking about here, you know, and, and can you act at multiple units of change? So, you know, can mission oriented innovation um, be focused at a neighborhood level, at a city level and at kind of a, a kind of country or policy kind of level? And the answer is presumably yes to all of all of those things. But the question then becomes, how do you ensure not just kind of shared di directionality, but, but kind of alignment? One of the things that feels powerful about portfolios is that done well, you can connect these different activities and actions together for kind of multiplier effects and greater uh, learning and, and momentum that, um, requires a kind of a level of coordination that I'm not sure we're particularly kind of or maybe coordination is the wrong word stewardship might be the, the right word where we start to um, start to kind of think about 
innovation ecosystems is the kind of framing that I kind of naturally revert to. I'm curious, Rowan, um, to what extent that kind of angle of trying to organize ecosystems uh, for innovation uh, fit into this kind of missions lens. Those are both, and they're, as you say, they are interlinked points. Um, I think that the, the interesting point that I try and make with the idea that mission orientated innovation is hard is that it sounds easy because it does sound like it's top down. So in fact, the OECD or public sector observatory has drawn this kind of gorgeous little picture of these are the types of typologies of innovation and effectively mission orientated innovation is directed innovation and therefore it's top down, which you know, sends Mariana into a spin um, because the point is it's not, it's hard graph. So it does have that emergent element to it, which is that it would be completely futile and stupid to say, this is our mission. We're going, and this is why I actually get really annoyed with the net zero bollocks, sorry. But there, we, we live on a planet that will be continuing to evolve for many, many years. And what in what context do we mean not net zero and how big do we cast our net? you know to get that net zero <laughs> so understanding that this is actually working in dynamic interplay but that missions create coherence so the point of narrative and to your point mm -hmm. tom of saying how do people why do people give a toss like well how does this have any materiality in anyone's life part of this is about creating some kind of coherence and also enabling you to spend money in in, in many instances you know to be able to have a a, a part of a portfolio which is to say we have dedicated funding here that is is catalytic for a particular mission and we're trying to do it the, the problem is in our human search for coherence we always overstep um and this is where your question about kind of lean startup or agile methodologies and where ultimately that's an entirely a continuous learning process that's learn and mm. adapt learn and adapt learn and adapt but if you don't have a bigger framing for learning and adapting and learning and adapting, you never question whether what you're doing is bollocks. And that's the biggest challenge that I have or worry about in public sector innovation. And it's sort of dig this, this march of the digital modalities without actually being able to, and the dynamic capabilities without actually going, why should we do this? We're working on one of our placement mm -hmm. teams is working with um, the government digital service. So government digital service is one of our members. They're doing a great piece of work, really amazing. They're learning so much about what it is to be innovative. Um, you know, they're so lucky to be inside GDS doing this piece of work, learning what it is to actually try and interrogate and deliver a program for personalization in government. At no point has anyone stopped and gone, is personalization actually a good idea? Or is it actually not appropriate right now for what we're doing? And that's a bigger adaptation that I would say requires some deeper thinking about missions, which is why understanding you can absolutely, Tom Beresford, never control the whole system. And that's one of my biggest problems with people, you know, imbibing Donella Meadows and saying there are all these points in the system which are leverage points and we could just pull that lever, everything would be go that way, it'd be great. That's obviously also bollocks. Excuse my language, I'm terribly rude. Um, but the being able to see the system, understand your inability to influence many parts of it, and then also then think about where in, in this can I practice is about thinking about innovation portfolios in a little bit more depth. They are messy, they are not perfect. I'm hearing that someone has unmuted themselves. Does that, do you want to add in a, anyone else wanting to add in a comment? comment? Brenton. Yeah. Um... So we had a bit of a conversation that feeds a little bit off of what you've just said about um, there's a little bit of a sort of near, there's a blind spot in the neoliberal language around picking winners and losers um, and not wanting to do that. And, and that sort of tends to be the argument against the mission oriented approach. Um, and so, and yet they're also very, at the same time, very supportive of startups, but startups just to do whatever they want, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be sort of choosing their directionality. And so I guess, um, you know, we can say that's, that's, you know, bollocks to use a, a, a sort of a phrase of the moment. Um, but the problem is that these are people who are currently setting our sort of national debate. And so it's, it's, it's a little bit, um, <laughs> what, what do you say to people who are operating in sort of systems where actually the, you know, the, the, the people, so egg facts, sorry, back up. Last week, I interviewed the head of the Victorian Public Service who are using the mission approach to frame 
their directionality of activity um, uh, sort of in the recovery, which is brilliant. And, and we've, we've actually done a whole bunch of governance innovations um, about you know, new forms of collaboration between different tiers of government and so on. I asked the question, could we actually use this scaffolding and you know, for other missions, other purposes, other curves that we need to flatten? And the answer was, great idea, but unless you know, the national government gets it you know, and there's will there, it's not gonna happen. So I don't know, it was just a depressing kind of realization that there are just still some people who actually hold such veto points on the application of this way of thinking. And there are, and this again goes to the point of mission orientation innovation is not easy. And that these individual, I mean, this was similarly in the sort of public entrepreneurship work that I did, you would see continuous sort of system immune responses where you'd go in with fabulous ideas and then ultimately the system would reject them because it couldn't actually absorb them. Um, this requires grit and it requires continuous work as movement building as, as much as anything and and I think that part of the narrative building that we're also trying to look at is that ultimately the system the economic system that we are are using at the moment is pretty much on its last legs in terms of its ability to continue to promote growth evolutionary economics and disruptive innovation you know, in many instances, there's not an awful lot of creativity at the base of that. There's just the platform system that can disrupt the existing market. So you're actually just moving the market somewhere else as opposed to creating a new market. So the concepts of market shaping, the concepts of saying, actually, we need a green economy. And actually, there's very little in our economy that currently will actually enable that. So if you want a load of, you know, a bucket load of shovel ready projects, of course, you can just do public spending on infrastructure that needs doing like building roads but you could also try and make a new market through through different kinds of, of green innovations but because there's no existing market there you have to be creative this requires and this is why effectively you know mariana's pretty ballsy she just says it like it is and you know we have to move beyond deference and into respectful disagreement in which we can actually talk to the materiality of purpose and why purpose matters more than CSR. Not to say that CSR has been you know, in, unimportant. CSR has absolutely been an important part of our evolution towards purpose-driven businesses. But you could say that the financialization, and there's much evidence on this, the financialization of businesses over the last 15, 20 years, but really, really accelerated in the last 10 years, has actually meant that that very little venture capital is going into anything that's creating something profoundly new. It's just creating financial bubbles that extracts from the economy. So yeah, you can't talk to someone necessarily who understands their logic as the rules that they live by, but you might have to build a different system and prove it. And so maybe these pilots can be the thing that can do that, that you're working on. Okay, so, um, and Tom or James, that, that point that you made about, is that what politics is? One of the points that Mariana will continuously say is innovation is political. If it's not political, <laughs> then you're probably thinking it's easy and it's not easy. You know, sometimes if you're a creative talent, you know, design is easy. If you're a creative talent, you know, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to adopt, but it, it can be fun to work with some of the methods and they don't have to be friction full um, but ultimately innovation when you're doing this kind of innovation is not easy and you will have to fight mm. some battles but you'll get some results. Rowan it's Martin can I just quickly chip in on that and add two other pieces which come to mind as you speak including the political one of the issues it seems to me which is the political angle is whose purpose like mm. who gets to define these missions right and um, as Margaret Wheatley I used to say, does still say the Canadian writer, you know, the big, one of the big questions about these issues is who's not at the table. Absolutely. And it strikes me that uh, one of the risks or one of the issues around uh, the mission game is who, yeah, who gets to play and who's as it's, as it were, whose mission is it anyway? So that's one thing. And the second thing that occurs to me that is often not discussed is the feedback loop. In other words, one of the, one of the ways startups work out whether what they're doing is bollocks or not is whether anyone's interested. And you get that feedback pretty damn quick if you're a startup. Anyone wants, you know, if you if you can't find a customer, broadly speaking, and now I'm being fairly simple, then yes, what you're doing is a waste of time. Maybe a terribly good idea, but it's not going to go anywhere. 
no, it seems to me that. in the public space, mission and uh, this kind of work struggle sometimes to get feedback as to whether it's what, exactly the point you made. Should we stop a minute and just ask whether we are just completely chasing our own tail here? Um, in certain other types of human endeavor, you get that feedback every single day. Um, in the public space, you don't very often, or at least if you do, it's very muted or very complex. And that's the question of market shaping. Market shaping, again, is not easy because there's a question of, is it consumer markets that you're shaping? Or actually, are you mm. shaping something that's much bigger than a consumer market? And, sure. and that's, that, that's the issue. So I've drawn a picture here that no one will be able to see, but I will try and um, show you where this is my, in my PhD logic of the kind of innovation life cycle of the exploration and exploit, exploitation and of, of innovation. And in many instances, I would say most things, even all startups working in lean startup tend to be here. The market will already have sh been shaped. And I say in the borderlands between this kind of creative growth space, which is all very organic and around where ideas, I'll take a picture of it and send it to people because it's, but it's my like sketchbook. So it's, you know, complete nonsense but in this space at the top the market shaping is actually about saying okay what is the market then over here you have got scale and growth because you will have rapid growth if you're successful and that feedback loop is does anyone care but you no mm -hmm. one's going to care if the market hasn't been shaped so you know this is this is the point as markets can be shaped by social, social movements you know a huge bit market is being shaped right now for Black Lives Matter, which is actually saying, how do we actually deal with structural racism and inequalities? You know, that's not a financial or consumer market, but it is certainly a paradigm that will shape some of our ways of doing things. So when I'm talking about missions, I'm not saying a static mission, although we have so much research and so many of the green missions, we have so much research and evidence about the proof of, of man-made climate change that not gripping it is an absolute dereliction of duty now in the public sector so the missions need to be at the forefront and and this is the point where you know i boldly say that to people who are probably far more important than me but i just don't have the deference to say i'm sorry i'm not going to bring into the room you know we had a very very um expensive man come and talk to us about funding um to which i said you know there's no question here that climate change is not on the table of course climate change is in the table it's real it's not a conversation it's real so if that's not how you want to understand the conversation you can't be deferential to that conversation you know this is an important part of actually being able to stand into this is mission driven for humanity <laughs> there, there i am with my bleeding partners going on again but it's an important way of thinking about missions in a in a less responsive or reactive way in a, in a less I'm worried about what people think and I'm more actually thinking about what we should be doing and be and, and bringing materiality to that. Tatavik, you have raised a hand and um, then I should move to my final deck otherwise we'll never get through the case studies. <laughs> Great, thanks Erin. Just a quick question about that specific example. What was their reaction? How did they respond to that? I if have you faced, can share. you know, well, I mean, I have faced blank looks my entire life. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing, I've been doing, you know, I had to do the public inquiry for London 2012 on and fight for, you know, community voices in the planning. That was incredibly hard to do, to take on. This is why I came up with a kind of concept of practitioner burden. I feel like I've held it myself my entire career, but it's increasingly what we must do. We can't, otherwise it's performative social innovation. Social innovation takes risks. And what I realize is if social innovation is entirely geared towards scale, it doesn't take risks. And so in that, in that instance, you know, I received a blank look. I received blank looks all the time. One of the reasons why I'm doing my PhD looking specifically also at social neuroscience is that as humans, we are geared towards homophily and the desire for people to understand and react to us in a, you know, to, I, I need you guys to smile and give me lots of thumbs ups because otherwise I'm sitting there thinking I'm talking into a weird vacuum and no one even understands what I'm talking about. But, and so I will be geared, oh, bless you all, uh, but I will be geared towards needing that social response. And so we all are. And so when I put myself out there and say, sorry, climate change is a reality, that is going to feel personally disruptive to me, but I have to build my grit and strength to handle those conversations over and over and over again. And that's why it's useful to, to work with people as that narrative builds, because 
as much as anything, playing to Brenton's point, so many people, if they're just trying to obey the current rule book, are not reading the room. They are not looking outside the window and going, actually, you know, that, that, com that, that wonderful cartoon of the dog going, this is fine. Well, you know, the world's on fire. You know, I had an interesting conversation actually with an Australian um, innovation organization where they were saying, so what do you think is the challenges for the future? And I was like, do you not think that you're screwed already? You know, like, seriously, you're on fire, you know, like look outside. And so to be able to say everything is fine and then actually the challenges are so real and readily upon us and that we are not looking beyond even our own lives, let alone our children's lives, is, is a dereliction of duty. So I, there, you, there you go, there's my, there's my little soapbox that I will come off and talk about some case studies now. Um, but I think it's an important, important thing to recognise that missions require passion. <laughs> if you don't care, don't get in the room. So I will hand back over to myself in this um, shared screen. Uh, and this plays immediately to Martin's, Martin's point, um, which is, uh, are you ready? And you, Martin, can you guys see that? Because I, if I don't have you, yeah, there you go. Um, there are of course vital and important considerations and and the question of having the system in the room which is one of the approaches that Vinova does to try and understand how to ensure that the selection of missions has kind of got comprehensive is that it will never be comprehensive there will always be who people who are not in the room and one of the things that I've, I've done lots of systems change workshops in the past working with practitioners in public services and you hear continuously, if I was in the room earlier, they wouldn't have made that decision. And you go, well, there is only the moment at which you enter the room that that can actually show, you know, that's the beginning for you. There is no beginning and there is no end of these things. They, they become entities and they have a life cycle and then they die. You know, where you are in this system needs to be that you are constantly inquiring into who else needs to, you know, who's not missing, who's, miss who's, who's, who's missing from this dialogue. How do we deal with the issues of structural inequalities? How legitimate is this mission? If you're talking about climate change, you know, who does this affect? If you're talking about smart specialization in a locality, actually, how am I going to benefit if I'm in that locality? You know, how legitimate is that mission to someone who lives there? Um, how will you connect to and engage with the citizens of that space? You know, and, and then how do you know that your mission is a good one, which is why everyone loves net zero. And I, I don't think it's, you know, I don't mean to completely, um, uh, you know, rain down on, on net zero. My challenge with net zero is it's frictionless. It sounds clean. It sounds like you can spit stuff into a spreadsheet. And the reality of actually deep, going deep into climate change is that we need to think about major changes in our, in our system and our economic structures. As alongside incentivizing and shaping new green clean markets, technology will not solve everything. We do need to stop flying all over the world. You know, we've had a, a, a major change in our um, carbon outputs as a result of the pandemic that we want to keep ratcheting back up again. You know, the, the questions of impact are really important. How, is, how do you have a learning process? I think your point is really important, Martin. You know, that flexible and adaptivity learning from the system, but understanding what you are learning from if the system is only the market feedback says no we don't like your product it's not just about optimizing that product it's maybe also about trying to understand does the market need shaping a bit more um, and then how do you have accountability mechanisms you are working with public money so you know you can't just front that off and say well we're spending this money because you know we want a portfolio of innovations that are going to address climate change you need to be making sure that you are doing proactive portfolio management, that you take applied risks um, and that you understand that there are some mechanisms that won't work and you can kill stuff when it, when it doesn't work. Um, and then that really plays into the questions of capability. So effectively this, this next session, um, I'm just gonna speak very briefly to, um, to the kind of case studies, if you like, from the network. And I think what I'll do is I will cut out the final, recognising that I'm going to have to do that in five minutes and then we'd be done. So I will cut out the final 
if this gets your approval, the final breakout in order for you to um, just do just have a kind of closing circle, if you like. So effectively, I'll, I'll probably run for another 10 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes as a closing circle. Um, I don't know how that works yet. Yeah, I'm getting a few on the old thumbs ups there. Yeah, great. OK, so um, let me click through. The things that will appear in these case studies and what, what IOPP is studying is how countries, cities and institutions coordinate directed finance and, and also the industrial policy, innovation and R&D agendas. A major reason behind that is that is really where the upstream thinking goes. So much of Mariana's work has been focused with you know, institutions like the EU where there's a, you know, a, a, a sizable percentage of the Horizon 2027 budget has now been earmarked for missions, which effectively directs the missions um, towards you know, particular so societal challenges. We're also looking at you know, how the, these are implemented. And you know, sometimes that's looking at challenge prices, sometimes that's looking at dynamic implementation practices, sometimes that's looking at you know, the kind of how do you move fast in an organization and use procurement in different ways. Um, and then how do you build kind of capability to do this? Because you know, I would say we're at a sort of intergenerational moment where you have a leadership that is very out of step not just with digital practices so the movement and how how adaptive people can be with innovation but out of step with actually the kind of fundamental needs of of the next few generations and i don't just mean young people i mean thinking through the impacts of of the last 50 years of innovation and how we may need to do what i think sebastian was calling disinnovation i didn't really understand that but i'm going to go and find out more about it so i'll give you a quick run through um rapid pace through through five case studies the first one as i say mariana worked closely in in creating this sort of state instrument which is mission orientated research and innovation in the european union in which effectively there's a um a, a statutory instrument which means that they could actually put money behind missions the missions report provides clear insight on how research and innovation could create impact with societal res, uh, relevance and how to design and implement these missions the mission areas are adaptation to climate change, cancer, healthy oceans, climate neutral and smart cities, soil health and food. The next wave in that is really about actually the how. And I think that playing to Martin's point, this is really difficult to grip, you know, because actually the, the legacy of these organisations is that they will bring together expert panels or reference panels. They might have some kind of deliberative tool where they bring in citizen voices, uh, which is an aggregation effectively. It's much it's the way to kind of get quickly to understand citizens' insights is to have deliberative panels, but it's still not going to be entirely representative. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily a democratic tool. We're working with um, the Biscay region in Spain, Northern Spain, to actually say, what would it mean to do progressive tax policy that is actually led by the um, sustainable development goals? Um, so that is a sandbox in which we are working to understand the, if you like, the, the incentives and disincentives for actually changing financial policy, because they have impacts, if you like, on, on you know, when, when you change from a, a regressive, I'm not saying they have a regressive po um, tax policy system, but to get, that's an extremely um, political conversation, to start having a conversation about what is it to change tax policy away from incentives which are trying to drive one kind of behaviour into incentives that try to drive another kind of behaviour. So this is a sandbox environment working with stakeholders to really understand how do you um, consider new tax landscapes um, to meet a mission. We have worked with Greater Manchester Combined Authority, um, which was fundamentally trying to drive a faster route to um, a carbon neutral city region um, than the government agenda, which is the government national government agenda is 2045. And they've said we want to look at carbon neutral living um, by 2038. Um, similarly, they've set up some interesting instruments to try and do this. Um, they held a green summit. They, they had a lot of kind of engagement around um, a green activity, but largely they have set up um, 
task and finish groups and they are currently you know setting up experiments in you know and pilots in project areas um so this is kind of understanding how to do um a kind of clean growth mission for greater manchester working very much in partnership with the um, combined authority um Mariana, working with um, the Scottish national government or the Scottish government, um, has developed a mission orientated framework for a new public bank, the Scottish National Investment Bank. Um, the idea is that um, it's very much aligned with government. So it's, it's government spending, but it's directed um, spending and the missions are focusing um, on significant challenges and supporting, you know, back to Tom's point, supporting Scotland's transition to net zero is the bank's primary mission. The process that the bank is now in is, is in sort of understanding the markets and how to seed those markets. The biggest challenge here, um, and this again plays to the question of old logics, is a, a potential roadblock or stumbling block in this kind of environment is that you put out the money and then people rebrand themselves to fit the money um, because putting money out there in its own right is a statement and so you have to try and work very actively with the private sector in order to be shaping the market and they've got some really interesting tools in Scotland like CivTech which have tried to prototype um, challenge-based uh, responses there are questions about how you what you're shaping you know are you shaping actually collaborations with existing big tech firms or are you trying to shape uh, a market for startups what is that type diverse um, portfolio that they'll want to be investing in um, and then there's kfw which is effectively the prototype or the, or the original in terms of the the bank that was that funds for missions so um, germany um, is this is kfw the german uh, national public bank um, and is they are the primary investor in domestic investors in environmental and climate protection um, largely following um, and i will say this wrong sorry to the germans who are in the room energy vending um, sorry uh, which is the planned transition to low carbon nuclear free economy um, while it may or may not be um, a kind of perfect solution, what we what we see here is that that direction that comes from central government, which is political and purposeful, which is we are moving away from nuclear and we want to move towards a low carbon economy, as you can see from actually the kind of the growth in investment, it did drive what large scale in investment um, as the as the kind of key financier of renewables and supporting that policy so that you've got this kind of joined up policy to actually deliver on a government mission. And then at a kind of more uh, meso, uh, thinking about that kind of macro meso and micro thing, a more meso approach is the recent approach from Vinova. So Vinova is the Swedish innovation agency based um, uh, and uh, our, our member is Dan Hill, who I think has been speaking in the States of Change thing in some way. I'm not sure exactly how. Um, they have been working with us at IPP. He's a visiting professor. They've been working on actually what is a design process to actually bring in the concepts of missions so that you to try to, you know, what Dan likes to talk about is the system in a room. So how you start doing this co-design process together so that you start building a mission portfolio. Um, it's very design-led. Uh, it does work with the concept of prototyping, the concept of actually trying to make, um, you know, visible demonstrators or interventions in a system to then see how that might make change. And it's very purposefully a public-private partnership. So they're working, for example, with IKEA as a food supplier to think about the, the healthy, sustainable food mission. So that's a very rapid run through. I did promise that I'd be able to do that in 10 minutes. Um, and before I, um, so I will delete that, those sections um, and then just kind of go into the final things that I was going to say, which is, I think I've said this, reiterated it quite a lot already in my forceful and slightly sweary um, in, interactions. Missions are, are complex. Um, this is a, 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 a sort of input from one of our members, Climate Kick, where you know, she recognises that these are systems to change initiatives that they're working on. So they're working on multiple demonstrators within a single portfolio. 
And systems change, change initiatives face higher levels of complexity and are far more unpredictable. They need to adopt management systems which can respond quickly and flexibly and, uh, and use adaptive management. Again, playing to this, how do you have this blend of this you know, visionary input, but at the same time, adaptive management. And when she talks about that, she talks about flexible finance, devolved decision-making, flexible monitoring and evaluation systems, which all sounds great in practice, but everyone will have done what Brenton's done, which is run up against someone who goes, I'm oh, sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. And that's not my evaluation system. So you are still working, even as an adaptive, you can create wonderful sense-making and adaptive tools, but you must make sure that they're not just relevant to you, or at least you can describe them and cross those borders, span the boundary of the people who don't understand. And one of the things that I think Mariana has done very well is actually speak to the economics, you know, and I think I would, I, this, some of the books that she's put to, pr produced um, around mission orientated finance might seem incredibly structured on the financing, but it's really important to go there so that you don't create these dynamic tools, but they don't speak to the underpinning, if you like, system defaults, which is the computer will say no because the money will say no. Um, and there, there is a, you know, demand, if you like, for government to start thinking about financial reg regulations that induce and mandate investment into green transition. Um, industrial policy is a tool that may be used to start pushing and, and encouraging changes in consumer behaviour. Public procurement is a way of thinking about how you initiate kind of if you like, tilt the playing field towards um, green solutions and then that, that means that you're not buying off-the-shelf products but actually or, or as I described before old wine in new bottles. And then really thinking about how we retool and rebuild the capability in government in order to be able to do this kind of deep thinking and work as problem solvers, market shapers and grant makers, which, as I say, is extremely hard work. And I'll just um, end with a couple of insights. One is, you know, and I, I won't go into these, but I had a really interesting conversation with the New Zealand government looking at their um, apologies for my terrible pronunciation, a terror circle, which is focused on sustainable finance and really recognizing the flaws and you know really it's really gone deep into recognizing the flaws of our existing financial system and how it will reject much of this stuff because many environmental and social impacts are still seen as externalities so we need to think about that particularly in that those externalities as i said earlier have got extremely big and in many instances those externalities are the substance of the missions and so we really are it's it's not just a market correction it's a reshape in a, in a different direction um, that requires that we rethink valuation models and someone was talking about VC models and how we how the market is geared by where the venture capitalist wants to wants to get the money. It, 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 it very much is, but that is a race to the bottom. If we continue to work with shareholder primacy and Andy Haldane writes a great piece in the Rethinking Capitalism book about short termism and, and market capitalism and how it would basically eat itself if we continue to use the fiduciary duty of shareholders to bring the greatest return on investment because we will just keep taking the cash and building nothing of any substantive value. Then this reality check is not easy. You don't, all the things you pointed there, it's not a linear process. You know, I'm totally the biggest Ma Margaret Wheatley fan who ever did live. Um, you can't just define a mission, identify barriers to the, between the current system and the mission design a good system and then where the levers might be because the power to redesign systems is not within your gift that's a margin of complexity that is far too far you are one part of a wider system over which you have incomplete knowledge and minimal control so never confuse your requirements of policy making with their dynamics and your ability to influence them that doesn't mean don't do it because that you could just go well what's the point that doesn't mean don't do it. It is about being humble and having humility in the mission that you want to undertake, but then really owning it. You know, I want to see a, grand, a, a green transition. I want my children's future to be better. I would like my children to have great grandchildren. You know, for that to be the case, that means that this is a legitimate conversation for us to move forward with. And my final reflection is, and this has been the reflection that I've built over many, many years of this work, is that you know, act where you can. Um, there are three ways of acting in order to attend starting this work. One is understanding where you can act. And if that's about organizing a, set, a, a, a group to start building a mission, use that as a skimmer. You see that kind of little stack of stones, you can do that. Just take that action. You have permission to do it. 
the hard work is in, as you all described earlier, and many of you have described earlier, how do you do this in big groups? This is absolutely why I've located my PhD on the on the impacts of working with other humans. You know, so much of what we do actually defines the barriers of, of, of what we can do. So push what moves. But if you can't push, sometimes you'll need to work out how you work together. And that requires deep, continuous engagement with those people, understanding the politics, understanding that you are committed to a mission and understanding how you adapt and are flexible to that. But then also recognize what doesn't move um, because this is where the practitioner burden comes on. If you are continuously pushing the purpose-driven innovation in a landscape which is just not listening and can't onboard you, you know, maybe think about how do I take my, my desire for this some, somewhere else or through a different avenue because you, know, you, will, you will set yourself on fire with the, the frustration of it not of it not um, making, you know, coming good. So with that, I will leave you. I see that there are some things in the chat. Um, I'm gonna unshare my screen so that I can see you guys again. And then we can just close out. So does anyone want to ha have, have anything um, they want to add in? I'm trying to look at your... But could you say a little bit more about um, the, the human aspect and, and how you collaborate? Um, I'm also very interested in like the neuroscience and the systems, group systems. It'd be lovely to hear your perspective on that. Um, I think it's the, it's the missing piece and it's one of the things that, because it doesn't have materiality, and I think Hilary Cotton's tried to work to this in much of the work she's done around relational state and, and trying to bring the you know the reality of what it is to work deeply with people into it but you know relationships don't appear very much in innovation and in the innovation discourse we see them again a bit like an externality um, and i would say that for any of this stuff to work um, at a foundational level you need to have psychological safety in rooms and what psychological safety actually means is trust you know, it's the ability for me, you know, I think you guys are all amazing, but I don't know you. <laughs> so I, ultimately, it would take more time for us to get deeper in order to work together. We need to be able to dedicate that time, which often I think with things like, well, this is this is an interesting one, because often the deep work that you sometimes do using things like agile, where you are talking a lot and you're moving forward and you're learning, you actually do build some quite robust relationships and that's a really good thing i think how you think together and how you go beyond the normative that's my the big the big challenge is how you have discourse that goes beyond the how do we optimize how do we drive things forward quickly how are we all on the same page let's go move done that those are dynamic capabilities but they're not asking you to think deeply about how are we doing this and that's those are my fears about net zero you know my my deepest worry about net zero as a kind of very charismatic tool is that you can end up creating markets where someone is selling you really toxic nitrogen because it's your best value impact in terms of if you buy that and you bury it, you will actually do that. You'll have the biggest impact on, on carbon you know, risk the, you will reduce your carbon risk because that someone has created that market. They have created the impact investment ESG market. There is no human in that. There's just a product which makes impact investors feel very happy because it fits into their spreadsheet and they can optimize their spreadsheet. The reality of getting to net zero is that we have to work together and we have to understand what we're doing in our lifestyles, in our, in our ways of being, in our consumption habits, in our behaviours, that's part of, and that requires relationships. So I don't have any answers other than to say, I think that actually climate change is an extremely human concern and it can, it can, it can be externalised and our relationships can be externalised in service to moving fast to get to net zero. And I think we're missing a trick if we do that. You know, it, it, it assumes a kind of end of planet scenario if you do that, if you really think about it, it sort of kind of goes, the end of the planet happens when I've fixed it before, you know, I've got to fix it before I get to the end of the planet. Well, no, we're, we're, 
we're all we will die but our generations won't don't have to die in you know just because of that anyway that's all getting very existential go Gemma I, we're out of time but I, I love that ending point on the and you brought it up a few times in this conversation around practitioner fatigue and I know we don't have much time to go into this now but I think what I notice in the organization I'm working in is actually that that messy work of humans beyond our work and in, in all the systems that we're interacting within is exhausting and mm -hmm. is so complex and I think the, the often the challenge that I'm trying to address is that how um, how we don't place the burden of change upon those who are um, most vulnerable, you know, to a front line. But actually, what we mean by that is those closest to the problem. And the work that we're doing in the Children's Society, I'm leading on, is around building those systems and structures for change processes and support, so building that psychological safety. Um, but the thing you've just touched on is so deeply rooted in any of these processes around emission in messy societal change is 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 all that it involves and actually our our efforts might just turn the dial slightly before the system itself moves again you know systems are adaptive and messy and we cannot control things beyond our control um but that that, that last point just on, on practitioner fatigue and how you might develop safe spaces or support and recognize the many who are in that place um i just wonder from my from our organization how I keep you know cultivate that it's uh... I think I think just starting with the recognition that actually I mean and this goes into the social neuroscience there is you know my 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 supervisor Lasana Harris I would I would share his work actually because he looks at dehumanization and social neuroscience and his work has shown it is much easier and much less taxing on one's brain <laughs> it takes far fewer calories to work with a spreadsheet than it does to work with a human. And that is a really important, you know, I love people. I'm really chatty. I talk, you know, nonsense all the time to anyone who listens to me. But at the same time, I find it fatiguing, you know, to, to have conversations. I go home and I need to, to lock myself in a little room for a little while with a cup of tea. To, to, we don't accept that these things are much broader and that relational practice, you only take away that weight of, um, it, you know that calorific weight when you deepen your relationships trust comes over time you probably don't know anyone till you've known them for two years you know so and that doesn't mean get stuck in the dynamic of your relationship but it does mean building that resilient infrastructure that cares about each other that trusts each other that knows that it can adapt and this is where i'm excited by your place-based ideas you know if you're in a place you're there you know those people so keep that going keep that conversation so that it's dynamic make those relationships material they're not an externality they're absolutely central to to innovation going forward but i am now over time and nicole's looking a bit un uncomfortable um any any final questions otherwise i, I think I've, I've probably um totally over overshared <laughs> oh thanks thank you so much that was really interesting Uh, yeah, look, thank you, Rowan. That was fantastic. And lots of food for thought there. Um, for me, my, my, I've written down my, my takeaways are get into finance and get into politics. So I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit with that tonight. <laughs> Excellent. As well as get into that puppy because you've got a puppy as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to go, right. I've got to go see my, yeah, I'm going to go see my puppy that arrived about two hours ago. So uh, great to see you all. Thanks again, Rowan. And, Thanks uh, so much, Rowan. Thanks. Thanks. I've you. Turn off your mics and say goodbye. Thank Let's you. have some hear your voices. Bye. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye everyone. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the discussion.